like, Mom, what do you mean? You're not so late. What is up with that? I lost my voice again. This is like the third time in a month. I don't know what happened. Okay, I could not be more excited about this conversation because it happened in Cannes. It did. It all happened in Cannes. What happens in Cannes does not stay in Cannes because I am going to brag about this loud and louder because I just have not stopped smiling from this. And it's all about possibility. And, you know, it's really amazing because in Davos, which is when we leave here, we go to Davos, and the sign which I, we're sharing live in 100 countries right now, it is going to say equality is possible if you want it. And I think it's really what you know my whole career has been about breaking all the rules that make no sense and creating new ones and interestingly enough on my basketball court a couple of years ago um julie and kara nortman met and what happened angel city formed and what happened in our lounge in cam two remarkable women met and what's happening now something brand new and i can't wait for you to share it with everybody because the news just broke and I was fortunate to meet a fabulous woman named Sue Bird, who, when you think about, you know, my whole career, I, the rules didn't work for me, so I had to break the rules. This is how I became chief troublemaker. <laughs> when the rules don't work, you have to break them and create new ones. And, you know, I say there's two types of people, those that see what they see, which is status quo, and those that see what's possible. And you don't look at the past at the challenges, but you look at the possibilities, the future, the opportunities, and create it. And then you make it happen. And you say, wow, oh my God, look at that. And that is this incredible woman, Laura. I am so blown away by you, who you are, and that you see possibilities, and you reach for the moon, and you grab every single star that's out there and you are not afraid. So with that very long opening, um, I just want you both to know I am so proud, inspired. You gave me goosebumps and I could not be more excited. So please, Thank you. each of you, please tell us who you are, what you do and what you are creating together. And just hearing that song, I Am, I'd like you each to end that sentence before you start by saying, I am what? You want to start there? Just start with, I am what? Well, I am a shark. You, uh, that was a layup. <laughs> Sue? Like, I am Sue. <laughs> <laughs> Is that good? Okay. How do we do? <laughs> You're A plus plus. Okay, give it, now take it from here. Sure. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm Laura Carenti, founder and CEO of Deep Blue Sports and Entertainment and also partner at Giant Spoon. Joined here by my recently announced partner at Deep Blue, who needs no introduction, but I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, everybody. I'm Sue Bird, um, former professional basketball player, played in the WMA a long time and all the things. Um, recently retired, was trying to figure out what I want to do next. Um, some of that has to do with a company I helped found called Together, um, which is a you know media commerce company, a touch more production company, and then dot, 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 as Shelly said, met Laura and Can, and now here we are. I am a proud member. I guess the technical title, I'm still getting used to this, is Chief Strategy Officer. Um, I, she wanted it to be chief point guard officer, but I'm like, so I don't know that that goes on. That's much better. But I don't think Bre procurement has rules. that on the rate card. Make your own matter. rules. Make okay. your own rules. Chief strategy officer right. really is done, does not fit you. Well, great. Effective. We're changing change it. it. Chief CPG. Point guard Here we go. So much better. Yeah. Chief Break, PGO. Breaking. There it is. That's so Making good. Make my own title. Chief PGO. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. That sounds really good. <laughs> yeah. Make it up. We'll talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Make it up. Yeah. There you go. And here we are. Because then people will ask you what that is, and it, it'll go into procurement. We'll write it in. That's why I keep my AOL account. <laughs> this is true. Right. They're That's like, oh, AOL, tell me about that. I'm like, oh, it's funny you ask. <laughs> it's a good conversation starter. Yeah, so much better. Because, you know, also, it's all about lived experience, which is what's going to make you so successful, because we're going to discuss. OK, but let's go to, first of all, what was the wow? Like, there's always, I call them heartbeat moments. Ba boom, ba boom. Your head tells you one thing, but uh, that's textbook. Your heart is what I always follow. And you know, female intuition is follow your heart. Like, I got it all makes sense. 
Like, follow your heart. It takes you down the path, right or wrong. You got to follow your heart because if your heart's being really fast, you better follow it or something bad will happen. Yeah, I'll so, take you to a very specific moment because I remember it like yeah. it was yesterday and this will um, not surprise anybody in the room who knows me, but it actually happened at the Jersey Shore. Um, it was the 2019 Women's World Cup. Um, the U.S. won. And if everybody remembers, you go back in that moment in time in France and the whole crowd is chanting, equal pay, equal pay. Nike puts up this gorgeous spot, really talking about the mission and, and the opportunity. Um, but I had this like bizarre moment. I'm with my childhood best friend. We grew up playing soccer together. Kind of walked out of the room and just had the urge, um, knowing full well that many of the women that played for the U.S. Women's National Team would be returning to the NWSL, our domestic league here in the States, and was curious to know what the commercial, as a, as a marketer, and particularly growing up on the media side, what did it look like? And how were we actually going to capitalize on this every four years? Like this time it's gonna be different conversation. Um, and I'll tell you, and it's imprinted in my, my brain, uh, I scrolled to the very bottom of the NWSL website, this is 2019, and there were four corporate partners. There was Nike, they had the kits. Um, Lifetime, the women's cable network, uh, which was the media distribution partner of the league at the time. Thorn, the supplements company, and a lawn care company that I could never find the website for. And I remember thinking at that moment, I'm like, if these partners don't evolve, this conversation doesn't matter because the back end infrastructure of what it takes, as we all know, and again, growing up on the media side of the advertising industry, the domino effect that has to happen of brand investment into an ecosystem that's fully supported of the metrics that match the moment, right? And we shouldn't be buying women's sports based on reach and frequency. That's not where it's at in this life cycle stage today, but it is a loyal audience. Uh, the brand metrics around affinity, um, you know, thinking about word of mouth and, you know, all the favorability, all of these factors, but we're not buying it like that, right? So if you're um, a media buyer sitting in a holding company and you're tasked with nine times out of 10, the KPI of buying on reach and driving efficiencies, guess what's not gonna deliver on that when you're comparing it to Sunday night football, women's sports. So the metrics were wrong, the buying models were wrong. And so it just like took a deep dive and, and really truly, you know, this has been something I've been invested in for four years, really going down the hole um, and, and investigating. And, and as you kind of come up on the other side, you're like, you need to break the whole system. And what that's gonna require is not only, you know, being really loud and vocal about the model is incorrect, but the other side that I also felt was wildly missing, um, having sat through a number of these conversations with brands, is that the creative briefs that were, so you, so you, you fix the media, but then the messaging that's showing up in the media is not reflective, oftentimes, of the female athlete experience. And so, I'm like, well, why don't we have athletes at the table, and, and we joke saying this, but like from the onset, not when they're onset, right? Like that, that's not when they should be contributing to the conversation. And so wildly, Sue and I are in Ken, met for the first time, and it was like, why don't you just like start talking, what do you do? You know, I knew what she did. Um, and and uh, <laughs> we started like, I just like started going off about like these challenges, and naturally and organically, the conversation evolved, and I'm like, this is the piece of the puzzle that for some reason hasn't existed in the boardroom in this capacity and we need to change that. So I've been lucky enough that she said yes and here we are. Whoop, whoop. I mean, that story is just so, first of all, it's never shared. And all you hear about is, well, there's no eyeballs and that's that. And Never. That's not the case. Exactly, right. which is so messed up. I won't say the F word, even though I, I love that word. I'm from word. Jersey, so you can drop it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's just so true. You never hear the real reason. Okay, Sue, you were going to go there. Yeah, no, just Take to, to add to that. For me, it was live, this lived experience as an athlete and almost like a level of, and I don't, you don't use the F word lightly, I don't use this word lightly, uh, gaslight, but it was like a level of it where I'm like, okay, everyone's telling me nobody cares, but a grown man just chased me down the street to get my autograph. Yeah. I'm like, everyone tells me I, nobody cares, but the viewership numbers just continue to increase. Everybody tells me they don't care, but I walked into the arena and there's 20,000 people. So it was just like, what, what, what? And I think in, in meeting Laura, um, that was almost like a pullback of the curtain of understanding like, oh, there's like this whole world that impacts this that hasn't really been given the care for, for, for women's sports. And I think the best example is 
I watch a WNBA game, I see a commercial, and it's with an NBA player. And I'm like, this is weird. I know there's a WNBA version of this. Why aren't they showing it? And I went, oh, that's just the world, right? Because like for a lot of, you know, if you're not breaking the rules, and this was me for a, much of my, the early years of my career, I was like, oh, this is just the way it is. I didn't, I didn't know to ask. And Laura's like, oh no, people choose that. Those are decisions. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm like, that's just like someone in a room who, who just was like, oh yeah, put that commercial. And that's, the, that's when the light bulb went off for me. It was like, oh, there's a way to have major impact. And what I bring obviously is just the point of view of my experience, my lived experience as an athlete, which I think anyone can speak to in their careers. That's really, that's like a secret sauce. Right? So I might not have the business acumen, it's getting there. Um, but I have this experience that nobody else. still trying to figure out else. what PTO means. Yeah. <laughs> we just called it a day off, I don't know. But you have off tomorrow. Like, okay, cool. <laughs> I just, you know, it's just, it's so amazing to me because, you know, it, for me, I, obviously I've been in the boys club for 40 something years and I've always played my own game no matter what, you know, right or wrong, and owned it. And when I went to um, the ESPYs for um, a couple of years ago, it was to celebrate Title IX, and I was sitting next to Lisa, you know, all the legends, you and, and Megan Rapino and Lisa Leslie, and, and I was invited because of what I do with women in the corporate world. And I'm sitting in the front row, and it was during it was pandemic time, so it was just a small number. And we're in there, and they put the Title IX up on Billie Jean King, and, and they put the Title IX up, and it was so beautiful about equal pay and um, in sports with s soccer and with tennis, and I cried. And it was the most beautiful moment sharing your stories and how you play for the love of the game because it's not for the love of money because, you know, when you all found not out... Yet. No, it's a little bit. Not yet, but it was, and how you didn't have the same locker rooms, and you didn't have the same this, you didn't have the same that, and this is what was so crazy to me with jerseys, and how women's jerseys don't come in men's sizes, which really pissed me off. Men's jerseys, you know, men's names are in every, you know, men and women, but women's names aren't in men's sizes. But that night, it was the most beautiful night for me, feeling so proud of women in sports and Title IX and you know all of that. But I got home and I, went, I read the World Economic Forum report that said it'll take another 132 years to realize gender equality. And that night, I cried and I was so angry with myself that here I am sharing these numbers and I never paused to question how pathetic it was. And that was my heartbeat moment that I will not accept that and I will take that on with intentional action to create change. And so, I would like to, you know, A, talk about Deep Blue and the name, because I love it. Can you just explain first how you came up with the name? The hardest thing, truly, as a marketer, it's like, how can you not just come up with the name? Um, we went through many iterations, um, but Deep Blue um, is our namesake for the largest um, great white shark uh, ever recorded in the world who happens to be a female. Um, her name is Deep Blue. And uh, she also lives off the coast of Hawaii, and she's 60, so I feel like that's a life goal. Um, but uh, what, what but the thing that I... <laughs> I'll go join you in Hawaii. Um, but, you know, what's, what's interesting about it, too, and, and when you really, you know, there's definitely the shark energy and this, this level of a competitive spirit in what we're bringing and not apologizing for it. Um, and I think also looking at the fact that Sharks are consistently moving and they're always swimming forward. And that is all we are focused on. Consistently moving, always moving forward. And so, you know, to, to bring Sue, you know, just going back to something that she was talking about in terms of her chief point guard officer, something I want to talk about too with respect to transferable skills. Um, when I met Sue, I obviously knew who Sue Bird was. I'm a huge sports fan. Um, but I, in the first conversation, immediately realized I wasn't talking to just a WNBA legend. I was talking to a brilliant strategist, somebody who is asking the questions in a way, and not having been in, in many boardrooms that, that I've been in, in the, in the same capacity, with just a speed and a quickness and a like, wait, go back, like, and when you think about her skill set and the career that she's had over 20 plus years, driving the helm of the floor, 
this is where we want to focus and bringing those skills, not just the incredible acumen, you know, from a basketball sensibility, but the ability to see around corners. No, I wrote this on my LinkedIn when we announced it. It's like, I've watched hundreds of, she doesn't even know this, like so many highlights of her and I consistently noticed these ones that kept coming up on the no-look pass. To make a no-look pass and execute, you have eyes in the back of your head. To do what we're doing, that's what it's gonna take. And so I couldn't think of anybody better to be in, in the driver's seat with. Uh, by the way, as we know, the best leaders today are those that played team sports. So, and when you think about the best leader, it's one that is not an I, it's a we. And so, Sue, I wanna go to that because, you know, and that's why chief strategy officer, no, it's chief team. And that's why I, I like the point guard. I think we didn't business cards. Because, <laughs> but it's true because a point guard, you have to own the court and know where every player is and see ahead of where your the move is gonna go and where the ball is gonna go. I, 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 I have a good three-point shot, you know. I like to pass, I like to pass. Yeah, So. And, and it is, it's about passing and sharing and, you know, moving around the court and seeing that. So from your perspective, you know, and, and I really wanted to know that because I'm, I see some great um, messaging today and I think the best messaging, especially for women in sports, is storytelling because your stories are so incredibly amazing. What, um, content have you, and I want to call it content because it's not ad and selling at you. It's the storytelling that I think is so incredible is knowing who you are. That's what engages the audience. What's the best content you've seen so far that really resonates? It's content. Um, let me think about that because I'm, I, wa I did want to um, just touch on what you were saying. As an athlete, the transferable skills, um, and yeah, being on team sports, for me specifically being a point guard, but I do like to start by saying, if there were five of me on the court, we'd be trash. Like it wouldn't be a good team, right? Like five point guards, you, you need all those roles. And so I think understanding that in team sports really helps me when I approach that type of environment, basically like groups, just understanding everybody's gonna have their strength, everybody needs to feel empowered and bringing that to the table. Um, and then I think when you're this person, which is the point guard, um, the leader, whatever you want to call it, you also have to, and this is what I did throughout my career, just understand, like, what do, what does everyone, what, what, you know, what do people need? What do they like? What helps them play well, right? And try to just cultivate an environment that's going to allow for that. Um, and I think that was my secret sauce, getting the best out of others at times, even if that means I had to take a back seat. Because you know what? There's going to be another day where I'm going to have to take the front seat. And just kind of understanding that dance, and I think... Um, in terms of strategy, there's also, that's like a big part of it, is understanding people. And that's really what's not different when you walk in a boardroom, right? When I walk into the locker room day one of training camp and it's a new team, that's not that different from walking into a boardroom, meeting people, understanding what we're trying to do, right? This like larger common goal. And okay, how can we figure out how to get there? And yeah, thinking ahead. And that's again where where my bread and butter was as a basketball player. Let me get, let me think about that content one because yeah, yeah, no, there's been, if you're actually talking about like, do I watch Netflix and check things out? What do I see? Yes, there's not enough of, 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 of women's stories as athletes. That is where Shameless Plug together um, has done a great job of sharing those stories um, because they're out there and we just need to see them. So, I mean, so then, Laura, I'm gonna to come to you. So brands, because you know we were talking about brands not yet hitting it, which is why you started Deep Blue. What has, have you seen that has been successful from brand and sports? And then where do you see going? Because you map, you mapped out four key areas that you're gonna work on um, to bring brands and integrate them into sports. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just give a quick overview of sort of the blueprint of Deep Blue. So right now we're highly, highly focused on agency services, strategy, media, creative, and experiential, um, supporting brands specifically and at this point solely in the women's sports space. Coming out and, and identifying as a women's sports only organization has completely changed the way people have picked their heads up and acknowledged that when they look at their marketing plans for 2024, they look at their media buys, they, they've you know been working towards um, coming into this year, they recognize that it's very rarely um, a women's sports specific strategy that they have, they have a sports strategy and women's sports happens to be a line item and that impacts 
the messaging that impacts where and how they're showing up. It impacts the conversations and the metrics that they want to have. So this is about now thinking very intentionally about what your women's sports strategy is. Because to Sue's point, when I watched the World Cup um, this past year in the opening round, and I'm seeing creative uh, from brands that are officials um, sponsoring the World Cup, and they're running NBA creative in the Women's World Cup, I'm like, I'm so confused. Missed opportunity. And, and so, but that's what, that's what we're trying to do. And so it's, it's bringing that very deliberately, very intentionally. So we're focused on agency services. We'll be announcing our founding clients um, within the next few weeks, uh, which we're already underway with work on that we're very excited about. Um, and then we have ambitions to work with some endemic partners moving into the production space, particularly around brand supported originals. Um, we're seeing more and more brands want to play executive producer roles as opposed to badging and branding um, and integrating. So we're having those conversations. Um, and then future facing, you know, we have a plan that takes us all the way through LA 28. We're highly, highly focused on thinking about then the future of venture, commerce, M&A, and all that sort of stuff. So Deep Blue is intentionally not an agency. Um, it's a firm uh, with the intent of having multifaceted, you know, businesses within it. Um, and then outside of, of the day-to-day -day of the agency services, as we've been discussing, um, we hosted the Business of Women's Sports uh, Summit last year in New York City. We're going to be bringing that back again this year. And we're going to really um, be making a valiant effort to show up at not just industry events, but sporting events. Um, we're going to be at the Super Bowl uh, this year, hosting a women's sports exclusive uh, luncheon that we're really excited about. And so we have a series of those things happening. We'll be at Cannes, um, Paris for the Olympics, and on and on and on. So really putting a spotlight on what we're doing, uh, which we're very excited about. I, I'd love to hear from everyone. I'm giving you guys the last three minutes because I would love to hear your input at, for a new company starting up, what you would like to see for women in sports. And I think the best listening, the best research that we could do is to get input from all of you. Um, so I'm going to give you the microphone. So quickly, you have three minutes left so I don't get in trouble. What do you want to see? Tell us who you are, and please. I can stand. Hello, um, my name is Katie Geisreiter. I am a strategist at the IPG Media Lab working with Chelsea, who I saw you chatting with earlier. Um, I have a question. I'm actually going to read it off my phone because otherwise I'm going to spend the next three minutes taking up everyone's time. So as you have started uh, Deep Blue, how do you approach uh, working with clients who you know, may you know, ostensibly want to support women's equality, but then when, from like a political contributions perspective, they're, you know, backing candidates who are, uh, you know, putting forth anti-LGBTQ plus laws or uh, abortion bans. How do you kind of square those uh, fun couple things? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we're hyper-focused as a values-based business, and so that's how we're going to make our decisions with the clients that we're going to be working with moving forward, full stop. Um, we're very in tune with what the women's sports landscape um, stands for, what it supports, and the progressive uh, positions that it takes to move us all forward. And so those are the types of partners that we want to align ourselves with. Hi. <laughs> hey, I'm Rebecca. Nice to see everyone. Thank you for everything today. Um, question as an ex-agency girl. Um, sounds like you're building this firm with collaborators. I'd love to hear about how you're looking at emerging ath women athletes. So out of high school and college, will they have an accelerator incubator option to work with you? Such a fun question. So I am wearing the basketball jersey for Kiki Rice, who is a point guard for UCLA, <laughs> um, which first time I think this year, right this season, that Nike um, is obviously with NIL. Um, so supporting Kiki and the Bruins. Sorry, Sue. Um, <laughs> but uh, never lost you know, to them. It's fine. We, we are um, not in the athlete. <laughs> We're not in the athlete representation space, so that is a hard line that we are drawing. We are hyper, hyper focused on brand growth and commercial um, areas of the of the business. But I will say, um, in terms of NIL partnerships, in terms of you know, we're talking with teams, we're talking with agents, and just looking at where brands. There's a lot of questions. I mean, it's still very early days in the space. You know, all different laws across all different states, universities and institutions, conferences, and the NCAA still figuring it out. So I think at, at this point in time, our role will be representing brands in those conversations, but never say never. 
But also, like, obviously those brands partner with those athletes, right? And so that's, I think, where we're uniquely positioned myself. I, w I was that kid. I was that athlete. I know what it's like to go on set, and they're like, wear this. Put this on. Put this makeup on. You're kind of like, eh, it's not me, but... And so I just feel, I personally feel really excited that I'm going to be able to, to help younger athletes out in that way. By the way, it's so important because they really have no idea. Oh, was there a question over here? So I'm Allison, I'm Manette, and I work for Blueprint Sports, and we are a startup and work in the NIL space. So we work with 25, 26 schools right now across the country, Penn State, NC State, um, a number of them. We just took on Utah, Arkansas, and uh, we work with UNLV locally, and I was having this conversation with someone yesterday. You know, UNLV women's team here, uh, they won the Mountain West Championship last year. They were undefeated with Coach Lindy LaRock, super successful not as many eyes, and again, when you put them against somebody like an Arkansas or a Power Five school, they kind of get not as recognized, but just wanted to see what kind of work you've done, what kind of appetite there is for you guys to work in the NIL space, connecting these women to brands and kind of growing and making those partnerships even larger. Yeah, I mean, we um, are actively in conversations with somebody to head up an NIL division within the company. Obviously, as I said, it's early days, <laughs> okay? <laughs> we'll talk after. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think that we, we just need to get smarter and studied in the space and really understanding, you know, not just uh, the short-term wins, but the long-term impact. And, you know, for brands that are entering and aligning with incredible athletes um, that we see out there today, you know, thinking about also the long tail game. We've been talking a lot about this in terms of, you know, athletes that are going to be entering drafts and, you know, how do you stay with them through their professional career? So we're not looking at it in this myopic, just like in the moment. For us, it's, it really is about long tail strategy and growth. Last question, and then I'm going to get in trouble, <laughs> which I'm used Hi. to. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for this. My name is Lindsay. I work at Dot Dash Meredith, um, leading up a, one of our targeting capabilities called Decipher. And um, the question that I had for you all is, as you're thinking about growing sort of the engagement that you have with brands, I'd love to also have your perspective on how you're thinking about working with publishers or other content creators beyond the actual sort of women's sports broadcasters, because I think that there's a really massive audience to like rethink, you know, you're not just talking about thinking about uh, marketing in that specific context, but like, how do you th rethink who this audience is and like reaching them like sort of outside of the court or beyond the field? I'd love to understand how you're thinking about that as maybe a part of your future vision. Oh, we are not just solely focused on the women's sports like competition side. Um, no better example than the person sitting next to me. You know, we talk a lot about what do you eat for breakfast? What sneakers do you wear? Right? Like, maybe you want what to jump in on this one breakfast? because um, what do you eat for Sue is a great, so great. Uh, uh, for breakfast eggs I'm like I don't miss breakfast I always <laughs> eat eggs there you go um, but maybe you want to talk about like just some of the disparities yeah. in that, that question yeah. yeah the only thing I would I would say to that is um, I think what's amazing about women's athletes is how dynamic they are um, and I think what we're learning and there's actually data now which I mean I talked about that gaslight earlier this is every time I see something where new data comes out where it's like oh you know people do watch or people are engaged um, Women's athletes are different in that the engagement they have is like on another level, right? And so when you have somebody who's a fan of you, I mean, Laura actually, when Deep Blue got announced and it hit Instagram, she was like, oh, you have a lot of fans. I was like, oh yeah, they're coming. Yeah. Like they're gonna be there, you know? And that's different. That is what makes um, a woman's athlete so different. The, 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 the fan base, the, the people that are, and that's gonna go into those other, other realms, other places. And we just haven't tapped into it yet. Right? I was saying it earlier, it's like being told it doesn't exist, but knowing it does. We just haven't tapped into it yet. And so I, I imagine that we're going to be taking it into all different places, avenues, worlds. Um, and that's really exciting because that, that, that fan does exist. It's there. You don't have to build it. It's there. You just got to tap in. I think the other thing too is is casual fan versus you know hardcore fan and making sure that we're accounting for the broad spectrum and, and bringing people into the women's sports space, which obviously larger impact and influence on culture. However, they want to come in. So if you want to watch, you know, Sue and Megan, you know, decorating their new apartment in New York that's on the cover of El Decor, like that may speak to you, and you should be able to engage in that side, which I still want to know, like yeah, all the stuff, but. Um, 
point being, I think it's really uh, important that we're looking at the whole landscape. And so we can chat after because I know your platform does that, so yeah. But that is why, and I just want to reiterate, the importance of women in sports. It is so completely different than men in sports, and yet we've been thinking about it the same way, and you absolutely can't. And that's why I say content is queen, because the storytelling piece has been so untapped, and yet it is the most, um, it's been waiting to be unlocked. And every piece of research as a researcher we've done is saying the interest is there, it has just not been exposed. And so when Laura's talking about the measurement has been so upside down that if we, when we create this new model, just wait and the ROI, which is the return on investment, but also the return on impact will show us in droves how much money brands will make when they do this right. And when the out. measurement is right, it, the measurement is just wrong. So it's not producing the right results, which is so fucked up. Yeah. There is your F word. I just want to just close on some stats that I know you talk quite a bit about. Um, if you look at the C-suite, and this is a stat that's been widely reported on, over 90% of women in the C-suite have played sports at some point in their career. Over 50% of them at the collegiate level. So while everybody is focused on the visibility numbers, like, oh, women's sports move from 5% to 15%. It's like, I don't care about, I don't want to say I don't care about that number, but that's not what we're focused on. What we're focused on in the long tail social and economic gap, because if you know double digit percentage of young women are leaving sports, there was a study that just came out, Dove and Nike did, because of body confidence issues and a myriad of other reasons, in their early teen years, the gap then that exists between what could have been to the C-suite, how much we're leaving on the table from economic growth and societal impact. We are focused on bigger societal metrics, not the short-termism of percentage of distribution on television. If you guys are gonna quote anything, quote that. Share those numbers, because we're sharing the wrong numbers. We're sharing yesterday numbers that make no sense. Share tomorrow numbers that are the right numbers. That's how we grow. That's how change happens. That's where it's at. This is where it's at. This is the future. Here we go. Let's Thank go. You. Let's, Let's go. go. Right LFJ. Thank you. Woo, woo.